Okay, welcome back everybody uh, for our work session. Next up are discussion items uh, that uh, we will have on our action agenda um, for our January 22nd meeting. And we're going to start off with Will Crabtree. You've been good to start us off in the last section. You've been good to, to wait for us. So uh, an amendment to the maintenance and repair agreement. It's the first item up. Yes, uh, we're, we'd be asking for an amendment uh, to that agreement solely for mowing contracting. Uh, the reason we're asking for this is that we've had uh, quite a bit of uh, trouble with our, our previous contractor. Uh, and that contractor was uh, through Cabarrus County Schools, which is the fiscal agent for the maintenance agreement. Uh, we had multiple conversations uh, with the contractor and with Cabarrus County Schools about uh, our displeasure with the service. Uh, and it just took forever to get a resolution that was to our uh, satisfaction. So when uh, we looked at a way to resolve this, it was a mu mutually agreed that it would probably be better if that was just a direct allotment to Kannapolis City Schools and that we hired the contractor ourselves. Uh, then that would give us a little more control over the services that we receive. So that's what we're asking for. Ms. Dubois, do you want to chime in? I'm sure that you've looked over this. And Both school districts have had conversations with us as far as making this adjustment to their contract. It would just be a matter of us amending the, how we do our 112th allocation for building and grounds and we would, I guess, scrape out this portion of it for the mowing contract and give that money directly to Kannapolis on a regular basis. And my understanding is this, this would continue into the future. Correct. No, no additional funds. The, the 77 and plus thousand will be moved to Kannapolis. The other project will be decreased that amount for the other agreement. Right. Okay. The contract, are you using the same contractor now or have you gotten a different contractor at this point in time? At, at this point in time, we have a different contractor. There was, rough, there was a year left on the other contract and uh, we went, kind of went down the list. I went with Lynn and looked at some other contractors and we found one who would uh, fulfill this final year at the same price as the previous contractor. So, and that's that's contract we're using for the for the next year. Okay, and so you're you will be bidding this a after this next year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when does this contract contract end? What do you, where do you mean by year? Okay, uh, I think it states December or November first. I'd have to look. It's one or the other. Okay, there. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, November 1st is what we have. Of 2013 was when this contract that we're operating under now would end. So we would bid it starting that time period. Okay. For probably a three year period is what we have been using. Okay. And then at that time, um, Ms. Dubois, if their bid comes in higher than 77,180, we would have to adjust at that time when they rebid this at, towards the end of the year. I mean, because there's no guarantee that the, when this contract ends, that the same amount will be for the next, it'll be the same amount for the next three years. Correct. Uh, the way the allocations have been given to the schools is based on what the board approves. So if they were to not be able to meet that dollar requirement, I'm going to make a stab in the dark. It's going to come out of their general fund. That, that's, that's what I assume too. That's, so. that's what I assumed also, but it's always nice to get a response to make sure that <laughs> We have some idea of what uh, what you're talking about. Commissioners, do you have questions concerning this uh, change with the mowing contract? Okay. That sounds good then. Uh, the next item is also with you, Mr. Crabtree, for QSCB reallocation of funds. Uh, correct. Uh, what we're asking for is to move $1,855.63 from our budget for the Kannapolis Intermediate School HVAC over to our project for the Jackson Park HVAC. Uh, we have um, money available within the Kannapolis Intermediate School project to do this and that would help fin cover, finish up and cover the uh, cost that we have at Jackson Park. Any questions? Okay. You mentioned earlier that 
and I'm not certain if it was Kannapolis Intermediate School where you thought you were going to have twenty thousand dollars. I do believe uh, that we will have also. twenty thousand dollars left for the uh, roofing pro from the roofing project. Do you have any idea where you might be moving that at this time, or I don't know? What I would like to do with that, if if it's okay with the board, and, and I'll have to okay it with my board also, but what I would like to do with that is. Um, the commissioners awarded us money for two more projects, the Forest Park HVAC controls and the Fred L. Wilson HVAC controls, which we're going to bid uh, for the summer of 2013. I would like to hold on to that in case we need it to supplement those two projects. Good. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, Again, commissioners, nobody else has anything on these two items. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Jonathan Marshall, uh, presentation of proposed NCDOT's County Secondary Road Construction Program. Actually, luckily, Mark Morgan with the Division 10 office is going to be presenting that to you. When he's done with the presentation and your questions, any questions you may have on that, we'd also like to update you on the Raging Ridge Road and Bridge Project, and Tim Louder's here also when we get to that. Well, Mark? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bull. Um, you have before you tonight for consideration the proposed uh, Cabarrus County Secondary Construction Program for fiscal year 2012-2013. Uh, we're a little delayed in getting it out this year. The legislators uh, changed the rules on us uh, last July with House Bill 950, where they went from our normal countywide uh, priority rating to a statewide priority rating and lumped all the dirt roads remaining statewide into one massive priority and then divvied up accordingly. They pulled uh, 12 and a half million dollars off the top statewide and then based on the priority rankings, uh, did as many roads as they possibly could. Cabarrus County actually fared very well. Uh, in our division, the five county division, we only got four roads uh, statewide in order to build. Cabarrus got three of those uh, based on the priority. Those are the first three that you see on the front page. Uh, so technically we got additional monies of close to a million dollars to pave dirt roads. On the second page, the eight roads that you see are paved road improvements. Uh, about five years ago, the legislators decided that as we were paving down our dirt roads, that our maintenance needs were increasing on our paved roads uh, as well as development coming into roads that were substandard so we were allowed at that point to take some of the trust money that they set aside and do paved road improvements where we could go in and identify roads that maybe have a, a safety concern or runoffs or just not wide enough capacity wise to handle the traffic that's on them now and we can allocate those funds to do that and uh, you see what you have here before you these eight roads that were proposed by our Cabarrus County Maintenance Department to do here throughout the county. Those are, by the way, pages 44 and 45, I oh, believe, in your I'm agenda. That's yes, it. those are the first three there, uh, Winger, Deer Haven, and Old Sap, which were the dirt roads that are already approved through the statewide paving priority. That was part of the change in House Bill 952 is we did not have to bring the dirt roads before commissioners for approval. They actually approved it through the legislators and then the Board of Transportation so we could move forward trying to get them built. And we have actively started on all three roads uh, there. The, the page after that one are your paved road improvements throughout the county, which is what I'm bringing before you tonight for consideration and hopefully a resolution of approval. Uh, so that we can set those up and begin funding. Uh, all these roads are under the uh, premise that we will be done by June 30th of this year, and we have it scheduled to the point that we can be done. Uh, the statewide priority was set up for a one-year trial. Uh, depending on how well it goes before the legislators this year, it could be extended. Uh, if not, then it'll go back to the standard county by county statewide priority. Uh, I think as a whole, either way, uh, Cabarrus County will benefit because if they stay with the statewide priority, we'll probably receive somewhere between three and four roads again next year. Uh, if it goes back to the normal, we'll probably get those three or four roads as well. So it's not a big, big difference. It did hurt some counties. Uh, Stanley County did not receive any this year. And on top of that, their maintenance budget was cut. This helped Cabarrus because our, we lost about 30% in our maintenance budget this year so this helps supplement we actually come out with a, a net plus of two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars to the county so we're, we're looking at that as a very positive thing here in the county so that's what i bring before you tonight or answer any questions towards this if you have any 
And what we have is a resolution that, that we will pass at our regular meeting in two weeks. That's correct. So okay. Um, commissioners, do you have any questions about the projects from DOT? Um, just as a refresher and for our audience that listens at home, because I know I've asked this a couple times since I'm on the MPO board, mm -hmm. and uh, Jonathan is our staff rep on the MPO board, um, there are some areas that have dirt roads and residents are living across, along those roads and they wonder why their road doesn't get paved. So could you, I know that some of the reasons would be that people need to look at their deeds because sometimes in their deeds it says that they are responsible for paving the road. It and depends on the classification of the road. Mm -hmm. uh, first and foremost, we, we are probably, I guess it's a sign of the times receiving somewhere between 10 and 15 requests a month to add roads to our system. Uh, we, we cannot pave a dirt road that's not on our state maintained system. Uh, if it is unpaved, uh, if it's on our state maintained system, it is part of this priority. Uh, the priority, we rate and re-rate the priority every four years. This is actually a re-rating year. We just finished our re-rating process and have turned it over to Raleigh to either look at the statewide priority or the countywide priority. The, the ratings are based on traffic volumes, number of homes on the road, uh, businesses, school, whether it's a school bus route or not, and then that's based on a density volume based on the length of the road. As well, and it received points. The roads with the most number of points, number one, second, third, and so forth. Once it enters in uh, the rating system, uh, if it goes back to the county rating system, once it enters the top 10, it is frozen, and it cannot be removed from the top 10 at any point in time. At that point in time, that's when we begin the funding process. Uh, depending on how much we're allocated each year, we try to do as many miles as we possibly can. Uh, it may be we, we get the first three or four, and then we do those, and then number five and six and seven become one, two, and three, and it just, it's a revolving process that way. Um, there are roads out there. I think Cabarrus still has approximately 20 dirt roads. That's on our system at this point in time. We have five roads that are on what's called <laughs> right-of-way hold, where they have come up for paving before, but we could not acquire the right-of-way. Uh, if the property owners do not sign, there does not have to be a right-of-way on it to be on our system because we have several roads that were added to the system back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s where they just added them. Uh, nowadays, to add a road to the system, they do have to dedicate a right-of-way. But during, when it comes up for paving, we do go out and it is a requirement that they have to dedicate the right-of-way gratis in order for us to be able to come in and pave the road. And we've had several instances where they it could be family squabbles. They just don't want what they perceive to be the increased traffic of the paved road, and they don't sign as well. We have several of those in each county as well. But um, once again, if it's not on our system, if it was a subdivision road, and this gets convoluted sometimes, if it's a subdivision road that was platted after 1975, it has to be paved before we can add it. If it's prior to 1975, we can add it as a dirt road as long as it's platted properly and it has enough homes for density to build out. If it's a rural road, it's the same premise. If it was prior to 1975, we can add it. Uh, if it's after 1975, then it's supposed to be paved before we add it to the system. I knew there was a, I knew 1975 was an important year, uh, it was. apparently. When it came to roads, 1975 <laughs> was an important year. Any other questions on that part? Okay, next, uh, we do have Tim Louder here. If you want to come up and, and join kind of the microphone. Well, Tim is walking up uh, just, just to refresh you and, and perhaps with our newest commissioner to update him. Um, we've been working on the extension of Raging Ridge Drive, which is the road that accesses Hickory Ridge Middle School and High School. Right now, it dead ends at the, or ends at the football facility and practice fields behind Hickory Ridge High School. We want to extend that to Stallings Road, which involves a bridge over Back Creek. Um, W.K. Dixon had been retained by the county to design that and has done so, has done the preliminary designs for that, and then we've been working with North Carolina DOT on them actually overseeing the project, taking over um, the bidding and, and overseeing the construction. What we had arrived at last year was they, in fact, would do the bridge design, which will save us some money also through their bridge division. Um, so we were working on that premise, and it, which will require an agreement between the county and NCDOT. The funding for this project is monies that had been set aside from the construction of those schools. 
Um, and then in addition, the division office is contributing $250,000. And there is $250,000 that the schools and the county had requested from the legislature. And that has been approved, but has not passed or has not gone through the final Senate approval at this point. So we're waiting for that final piece of funding to bring that agreement before you. Um, I don't know if Tim wanted to add anything in terms of the design or Mark in terms of some of the other roads, because there are some other bridges in this area on Stallings Road, Hickory Ridge, Far Mill, mm -hmm. that are also going to be replaced fairly soon, because that is an area where we experience quite a bit of flooding in addition. Well, right now we're in the process of, um, we had to get a no-rise certification, which is very, very important to add a new bridge anywhere. And uh, we were able to go in and look at that with a, what we actually decided not to do with no rise, we went to Tomar, which would allow us a little more flexibility in our design, allow us to do some overflow and keep the cost down. We'll be able to build a bridge smaller and let it flow over the road in certain cases. So that is complete. The hydraulic report is probably 95% complete. It can't be completely finished until DOT Bridge Division comes back and says, this is a bridge we're going to build so we can finalize the report for it. <laughs> so anyway, that, that's kind of where we are right now. We, we, we basically have the, the preliminary layout of the roadway and the, and the geometry, at least that's the case, and it will be designed under DOT specs, and then we'll pass over them as their project to, to handle that, that part forward. We also, uh, as we talked a little bit earlier, Mark and I was talking, the, um, we're looking at other options with the participation of the town of Harrisburg and a few other things there with some concessions on how the, the, the sidewalks and, and some landscaping and stuff has to be done that can be maybe done at a later date and funded through a different funding cycle that will allow us to reduce the cost to a, to a blow a, a 1.2 million dollar level the mark is as our little magic threshold like 75 <laughs> this is 1.2 million dollars that will allow them to fund it through a, a, a their local funding that's correct we uh, we have a local what's called a purchase order limit of 1.2 million dollars that we can let a project locally uh, administer, build, and final, and turn loose. Uh, the, the general estimate that we have that we're tweaking a little bit right now, working with Tim on, is plus or minus around the 100,000 plus 1.2 or 100,000 minus 1.2, depending on what asphalt does today. Um, so what we're trying to do is we, we don't want to let anything that we feel we're going to exceed the 1.2 because of contingency levels at the end because we can't do that by general statute. So what we are looking at is what are some what we call low-hanging fruits that we can pull out. It's not necessarily have to go in to make the road functional when we build it. Uh, things like sidewalk, tree plantings. Some of these are Harrisburg requirements to go in uh, an additional wide sidewalk in this place. Um, and the trees that they want. So we've been working with Harrisburg, talking with Josh Watkins and the new town manager there. And they're in agreement. We're just trying to get the numbers down to a manageable number. And we're also offering that we have what's called enhancement monies, which is to build sidewalk and do plantings and things like that. And we actually have a pot of money uh, that our division operations engineer is in charge of that he's, if they can get their application and stuff in, we'll fund the sidewalk and the plans and they can come back and do them after we've built the road and opened it up with the agreement that we'll do the grading and have everything ready where nothing has to change with the road it'll be ready to just pour sidewalk plant trees and move forward that way and we think we can get the numbers down to even with our normal 10 15 percent contingency we can keep it under 1.2 uh, if it goes beyond 1.2 does it mean it can't be built no what it does mean though is it has to go through a formal Raleigh let and a formal Raleigh review and that formal, yeah, uh, Commissioner Wise, he's shaking his head, he's familiar with that. The formal Raleigh review would take it from, we can approve it locally probably within a month to six weeks, going finalizing everything, getting the contract ready. Raleigh's probably going, it's going to take six to nine months on top of that. So we would much rather keep it here locally. We have the flexibility that way to let it, uh, to deal with local issues that may come up and get, I think, probably get a better product out of it when we're done. Um, so that's sort of where we're at. We have a new bridge construction manager in the division now with that position has been vacant for about three months, which is what we're going to be dealing with with this design and everything. And I have, I spoke with him when we got back from the holidays, he's getting his feet in, getting it acclimated. Uh, we're probably going to be calling Tim, maybe doing a conference call this week, uh, and getting Raleigh on board with finishing up this design so we can move forward. Our project manager, Richie Hearn at the division has prepared a preliminary draft agreement. He can't finalize even the draft until we finalize the final funding 
component. And what Jonathan was referring to is the $250,000, I think there was 125 committed from the House of Representatives and 125,000 committed from uh, Senator Hartzell. The way that works in Raleigh, we don't get those monies. That goes directly from the legislators to the chief engineer's office in Raleigh. They send a letter of support. Once they receive that letter of support from the House or from the Senate, they will contact us locally to do the funding request for that amount. They've received the House request. We have it ready to go. They're waiting on the Senate request for 125,000. So we're at a, really we're missing 125,000. It's been committed to, they just have not received the letter so we can move forward with that. Uh, so once we have that, the rest of the fund is in place. We've committed 250 locally uh, out of our small construction project pot that we have, uh, along with the school money and everything else we have, we think we can pull it together and get it built. Hopefully after school goes out. <laughs> and if, actually it's a project too that we can let if everything come into place and you can do a lot of the work because it's beyond the school limits now and everything. So. You know, when you're building a bridge, you can't just plop one down in three months and then open it back up. And that'll be the, the key component to this is we can get in there and get that bridge started early on. Maybe kind of a segue into what Mark might talk about a little bit next is that the bridge replacement projects out there, they have three of them in the same area. <laughs> uh, when we started this project, what, three years ago maybe, Jonathan? Yeah. Uh, uh, we intended to hope to have that bridge in place so we could reroute traffic from both the schools uh, and not have the uh, Hickory Ridge bridge being impacted quite so much on traffic for schools. But unfortunately, that's not going to come before. So we'll come after your bridge replacement now. Well, right. we can, we have, we do have a bridge replacement on Farm Hill, Stalins Road, and Hickory Ridge all together. They will be lumped in and let, uh, it will be a Raleigh let. They're working on that right now through the, the this massive bridge program that we have. Uh, there's going to be some contingencies in there. They can only do one bridge at the time. They can't shut down all three at one time. That would just, I don't even want to receive the phone call for what would happen in Harrisburg if that happened. Uh, so they'll, they'll start. And there is some opportunities, though, with this one that if we started with those contracts on the Far Mill end, we might could get this road built in time that when we open Far Mill back up and had to close Stalins or Hickory Ridge, we could use this as the alternate route to run traffic through and help the, especially the schools in that area. So uh, we are, we will be coordinating with our new bridge program manager on that as well. Uh, so there's a, there's going to be a lot of bridge work, especially in Cabarrus County. I think we've identified it somewhere between 72 and 78 uh, bridges that need replacing or upgrading in the division, the five county area and around 32 of them are in Cabarrus. So next probably five years will be a lot of bridge work going on. So. The commissioners had asked that Harrisburg participate in this, and they are. I will actually, as the property owners, be bringing back to you the request that you petition to be annexed into Harrisburg, which helps them with their funding. Of course, you don't pay any taxes to the town, but allows them to spend some of their Powell Bill funds on sidewalks and road improvements, which will help them complete the sidewalks along this road. And that was my next question was about the right-of-ways and the connecting it over to Salings. Is all that for no, the most part? The, the last piece we're missing... <laughs> We, we will have to buy some right away from a, an adjacent prop most of the right away we own up to the creek on the other side of the creek between stallings road and the creek we will, we will have to buy from an adjacent property owner we've had discussions with that property owner we i will be honest have not reached any agreement but that's something the county will be in charge of it will be outside this project we'll be purchasing that right away for the project and i'll have to you know after we go through those negotiations bring that back to you Any questions on the Raging Ridge or comments? All right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Y'all have a good evening. Uh, Nestle, next we have Salisbury Row End Community Action Agency <coughs> presentation, fiscal year 13 14 application for funding. And Gene Harvey is here and Dion Atkins. Thank you very much. Good Atkins evening. To Good evening. present to us. Thank you. Yes, I'm Dr. Jean Harvey. I'm the Director of Youth and Family Services for Salisbury Real and Community Action Agency. Our home office is in Salisbury, 1300 West Bank Street, and we just recently moved to 1413 Sedan Avenue in Kannapolis. We were formerly co-located in the employment office for the last five years, I believe, in, 
in Cabarrus County. Salisbury Road Community Action Agency is one of 1,100 community action agencies across the country that were funded through the Economic Opportunity Act of 1965. So Salisbury Road Community Action Agency has been around for 47 years. And we have been getting community service block grant funding for over 20 years. So we're here today just because we are required by the North Carolina Administrative Code to present our application to you annually and just to tell you a little bit more about what we've done in the last year in Cabarrus County and what we plan to do in the years coming. Our budget is $383,809 and about $156,000 of that comes into Cabarrus County. We are in operation to help families rise above the poverty level. It's an economic self-sufficiency program and we serve 110 people annually and it's a 65 in Rowan County and 45 in Cabarrus County. I'm going to let Dion talk to you a little bit more about the uh, program aspects and then we'll summarize the budget at the end. Okay. I'm going to go over an overview of our community impact for the year 2012. Um, we were expected to service 110 program participants. However, we actually serviced um, 137. 50 of those participants were in Cabarrus County. Um, we also were expected to gain employment of at least 10 participants. Um, please keep in mind that many of our participants who come into the program are already employed. However, they may still be working part-time, so they are underemployed or may not be over, or they are never over our income guidelines if they qualify for our program. So um, our actual employ employment gain for both counties was 33, but Cabarrus County um, gained 22 participants um, for employment. Um, the total who rose above um, poverty guidelines were 20. Cabarrus County participants who rose ab above poverty guidelines were 14. Um, as far as those who were expected to obtain emergency assistance, there were 60. However, um, 21 participants in Cabarrus County gained um, emergency assistance. Um, we expected at least 20 of our participants to complete education training. Um, 17 of those participants actually um, completed that training. Um, we expected 15 to at least um, secure standardized housing. Um, only seven of those were able to do so. However, um, that was due to the lack of affordable housing here in Cabarrus County, which coincides with the Cabarrus County growth report that was just um, put out um, recently here. So even with um, referring our participants to affordable housing, um, there's still a two-year wait list. Um, individual accomplishments for 2012 um, through our program, we had nine nursing assistants um, to obtain certifications. Um, one person um, obtained a GED. We had persons um, completing driving school, truck driving school, those who enrolled in community um, college, um, we also had persons um, completing associate's degrees as well as bachelor degrees. And we had one in particular who went on to attend medical school in Boston. Now for 2013 and 2014, we expect to still serve at least 110 participants. Um, 45 of those participants should be out of Cabarrus County. Um, we expect at least um, 40 new participants for Cabarrus County as well. Um, we want at least 15 of those participants to rise above poverty guidelines. Um, we need at least 15 of them to obtain employment, and we want at least 15 to complete educational and training, um, four to secure standardized housing. Um, we want to at least serve 20 people for emergency assistance. Um, we want 15 to complete education. We want to supply daycare assistance as well to at least five. Um, 16 for transportation assistance, eight for health care assistance, 12 for food um, assistance, 10 for clothing assistance, and then we expect to um, service at least 10 for furniture and appliances. 
as far as our program is concerned, for the 2012-2013 year, um, it was important that we revamp the agency. So therefore, we decided to, with the instructions of the State Office of Economic Ar um, Opportunity, um, to develop a more intensive case management approach. So what we did was um, decided to start doing family development model, which is an empowerment model. Um, traditionally, case managers um, take on the deficit model, which is more of a medical model. Um, through family development, we work through empowering <coughs> the participants and working on their strengths. And we build off of their strengths in order to service them better. And we get a better outcome with that. Um, our agency structure um, is, well, um, I'm sorry, our program structure um, begins with the program director, then we have the pro um, contract manager, the assistant. We have five family development specialists. We have three who work in Rowan um, County and two who work in Cabarrus County. Um, what we do as a family development specialist is work with our families. We partner with them. We have them to make goals. And with that, we in turn support them, um, be it counseling, financially, and just help them to, well, empower them to achieve those goals. All of our participants are required to meet with family development specialists at least twice a month. Um, we also require at least one home visit per year. Um, in addition to that, um, most of our participants stay in a program at least a year. They can stay in our program up to three years if that's um, how long it takes for them to become self-sufficient. Um, and three years is the max um, for them to be in for program enrollment. Um, generally, our program, our program participants are walk-ins, but we do have a lot of um, referrals through partner agencies. Um, and the way we determine how urgent the need the applicant has is, you know, we look at whether or not they need child care, nutrition, housing, um, education, employment, um, if they're ready to work, vocational training, how much family support they have, and then if they're able to actually plan a goal. Um, some of the other things we um, provide through our program are self-help -work workshops. And these workshops are generally um, facilitated through partner agencies. We um, provide workshops such as understanding goal and planning activity, conducting employment searches, parenting skills, maintaining good health and nutrition, um, building healthy relationships, career and job readiness, and um, even entrepreneurship. So we have a variety of um, partners coming in. To name a few, we have the Health Alliance, Wood Forest Bank, Habitat for Humanity, um, Rowan Cabarrus Community College, and even the Small Business Administration. Our total budget, like I said, is 283809 The county split is Rowan is 226-886 and Cabarrus 156-923. That's determined by the number of people that are below poverty in the county. So that's determined by the state, not by us. And um, for this year, our fringe and our salaries take up two, over $270,000 of that. One of the things I wanted to say was the model that she talked about that we switched to last year, the agency was kind of known as an emergency assistance crisis kind of a service, and that is not the intent of the community service block grant the way it's outlined by the state. And so what we're doing now is we have full-time, two full-time family development specialists here where we had one and a half before. So we're serving more people, but we're also being more intent and intensive about the way we do our services. And so now we only have this year in the budget $43,500, which comes out to about if each person was going to get some kind of financial assistance around $400, but it doesn't always happen like that. 
but those things are used to buy books for school to go to Rowan Cabarrus or college if they're in a four-year college and sometimes bus passes gas if they need gas sometimes repairs for their cars and those kind of things so what the point I'm trying to make is with the we actually went through a paradigm shift where we said it's almost like the old adage you know if you teach a man to fish that's better than you know feeding them a fish every day so we made that switch because we found that people kept coming back for the same things over and over so their light bill would be due and they wouldn't be able to pay it and they didn't have the means to pay it and they didn't have a plan to pay it and then they'd come back next month for the same thing so once they hired me I said okay we need to teach people how to be able to budget how to be able to at least begin to work part-time or get some training so that they can begin the journey which some for some people is a long journey to rise above the poverty level but Cabarrus County has been more successful than Rowan. I think it's because there's more opportunities here, and we find that more people in Rowan go to school than go to work because there's less work opportunities. So we're just here today because we're required to submit the grant. We also wanted to talk about it with you, ask you if you had any questions, and then um, once you all meet on the 22nd, then the clerk needs to notarize that we did submit it to you, and you have 30 days to uh, submit comments. That's it. Okay. Um, I have two questions well main question and um, again since we're on TV it's always nice that um, you can get your message out um, we have a sheet of your board of directors membership roster and you have a couple vacant positions right on there um, you are hev heavily Rowan County on your board of directors and not as much in Cabarrus County so um, can you talk a little bit about if someone um, someone was interested in being on your board of directors for those two vacant positions how would how do you get members on your board and it, well let me just say first it's a 15 member board and it's a tripartite board representatives of the poor we like to say low income public and private and so the vacancies you have in front of you would need to be sent through to the the board chair and if somebody was interested and then they have the typical bylaws nominating committee in that process so I'm not involved at that Does that come through Bears County if they were <coughs> interested or who would they go through to yes and to the chair of the board of directors his okay. name is of Pete your William board of directors. Pete. yes okay so what would be that contact do you have that handy um, though? he could read he could be reached or information could be sent to him at um, our main office 13 and the main number is 704-633 Six six three three. Yeah, they just list the office as his contact information. Okay. So if someone in Cabarrus County were interested, you're looking for a for um, this representative vacancies. of the poor and representative of private organizations. Right. We have those two vacancies right now. Mm -hmm. They could at least make a contact with your main office to find out how any other steps they would need to do to become a member right. of your Right. If they were interested board. to be a member of the board and address that interest to William P. Kennedy. The chair of the board. Hopefully, we'll get some that information. We'll go out and people that see this um, on TV might understand. You know, uh, we like to encourage people to uh, serve on committees in the county and make a difference. And so that's why I want. When I noticed your vacancies, I wanted to make sure that uh, that got that information got out to um, Cabarrus County people that might be interested um, right. in serving. Because um, right now we have three representatives from Cabarrus County. You said that you used to be um, located at Employment Security. Yes. And now you're in your own building. Yes, we've grown and we have more space in our own and building. What's that address again? 1413 Sedan Avenue. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with Farrah Griggs' office. It's on Coach Street, and then Sedan Avenue is around the back. So if you come around the back, right off of Dale Earnhardt, we're we're there now. We moved there December 3rd, 2012. I'll make sure everybody knew where you would move to right closer so to the process <laughs> okay commissioners do you have any questions concerning their report or any questions concerning their activities and yes sir yeah. are, are these federal grants they're federal pass-through funds federal to the grants. state of office of economic opportunities OEO has now moved into DHHS Department of Health and Human Services at the state level but community service block grant funds are federal funds. It's all federal funds. Yeah. So out of three hundred. We don't apply federally. We apply through. Out state of three hundred and eighty-three thousand dollars, forty-three thousand went to help poor people. Correct. No, this year forty-three. No, it's all going to help, but we're doing it through the work that we, we do individually. But that's actual 
I don't want to call it cash assistance, but it's money that they will receive to help them. So they might get a bus pass or they might get books or what have you. But 43000 the, the you're correct. The rest of it's used in administrative costs, though. In staff time and family development time. So 11 or 12 percent actually is going to help the poor. I wouldn't say that, no. No, because the work that we do is intensive, and that's, that's even more valuable than giving somebody, a, you know, cash money. That's the way I view it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the way I understand no. it, it would be they're taking, their staff members are trying to Counselors, change coaches. a well, way of life that's currently going on so that instead of giving cash, it's a way of, of write, some, write your goals and actually come up with a plan so that you're not needing the cash you're changing the way that you're living your life exactly mm -hmm. that was well put. that's that's what i heard you say that's what we do they're trying we're to educate so that instead of waiting on the handout they're able to go out and get a job and be self-sufficient we have actually changed that what, paradigm what, what's changed the, the paradigm what's the difference in the programs y'all do and what dss does it's very different dss is a risk model and it's for a temporary period of time for people that need certain certain specific services like SNAP which is food stamps or they've even done away with we have a lot of, of our participants are the same participants but what they do is a totally different service than what we do first of all ours is voluntary and sometimes the SS is not and it's more focused on the children as is you can be a single individual single male you can come in and get services a lot of people that we serve cannot get services at all from DSS so we partner with DSS around some of their services but for instance recently <coughs> in any application I wrote this they have stopped giving child care subsidies to people that are in school so we had participants in our program that were going to school and getting a subsidy from DSS to get child care and now all of a sudden that's not available to them so then we have to go back to the drawing board and try to get creative and figure out a way. So we just need to continually negotiate and partner with some of the other agencies so that we can make sure that we all work together because these are the same people. You know, they're the people that need the help of multiple agencies. So it's very important that we all work together and, and don't, like as we begin to help them to get out of their situation, make sure there's not another agency that's working with them that might compound or even you know impede that progress because that can happen in other words if someone needs child care y'all pay all of it or no we, we can't afford to pay all of that but we can we work with people to get scholarships for child care but you said each individual got approximately four hundred dollars I said it doesn't work out if in a perfect world we could have a hundred people and give them four hundred dollars and say that's your mm -hmm. max but, but there, you got some people that don't need any money at all right. what they need is for them to sit with Dion and she can sit down sometimes people don't even know how to make a budget there's a lot of things mm -hmm. that we as professionals probably take for granted and even after they get jobs they need to come back because okay I didn't need a budget I didn't have any money so now I get a job and I actually am getting checks but I still don't know how to figure out how to manage that money, how to buy gas, how much do you spend on food, how much do you spend on child care. And so that's why the intensiveness of having people work with them one on one is, is far more important than paying a bill for them. Our program is not a put to put a band aid on a situation. We actually put our participants into a situation where we give them the tools, we give them the knowledge, we give them the, su the support that they need. So when they do leave our program, they are self-reliant and they don't go back into that situation because they have the knowledge to know, okay, this is how I got into this situation in the first place and I now know how to stay out of this situation. And they, in turn, become productive citizens and are able to give back to the, com uh, the, the, the community, and it just takes a load off of the local economy. That's, what our, that's the benefits our, of our program. What percentage of them don't have to come back, you know? Don't have You have to. any idea? I mean, so you got 100 people. You had 100 people last year. Are any of those coming back this year? No. No. None of them is coming back this year. All of them's got jobs and working. And they're over the income guidelines as well. Not all of them, no, because not all well, of them. Well, I mean, y'all don't keep an idea, y'all don't have any idea what the percentage is, 
Yeah, we also have procedures and processes by which you cannot come back. So if you leave and it's because you didn't stay in contact with us or what have you, they're, they're, you're going to have positive discharges and, and not so positive discharges. So people who weren't positively discharged because they either got, got a degree or went to school, uh, got a, a certificate programs are a lot more. Uh, people are getting paid more. Skills Gap Survey talked about <coughs> what kind of skills people need. And we know that it's not the traditional, you know, bachelor's degree and whatever so we train people and send them over to RCCC and that kind of thing so those people are not coming back okay but they're also working with other people to get jobs but the people that do not successfully complete our program cannot come right back because then that's a spot for somebody that may want to do it so there's at least a two-year waiting period before they can reapply and then they would have to show some progress on their own after they left us to be able to be eligible for our funds again Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that previously the organization um, was more of a, well, it tend to be more viewed by the clients as an immediate need. Emergency okay, assistance. Yeah, emergency assistance. And since you've changed that model to be more service oriented, you know, as far from an individual, what change in your budget? Did you hire additional counselors, or how did that reflect? Well, in Cabarrus, we had one and a half, and now we have two full time. And then part of that is is my job, and we're also paying for training on this model. The, the national model has been around since the 80s, and it's in like 25 states. So we're training all of our staff across the board in learning how to use this approach, so they make sure that they're not part of the problem. So that they're not enabling people too to just constantly say, "Okay, I'll pay your rent this month, and I'm right. going to pay it again next month," because that was some of what was happening. And now, and what we notice is they're coming and asking less, and I'm getting less and less requests from the family development specialist for because we pay via purchase order. Can you buy this? Can you buy that? People even coming up on their own with one of the other things we teach them is, "What is your support system?" You know, first the people would come in and say, I don't have anybody. So then we say, well, let me help you think about that for a minute. And then before you, after you brainstorm for a while, they think, well, maybe my grandmother could watch the child or, you know, that they expand their network. So we, those are the kind of things that you really can't put uh, a dollar, you know, you can't measure right. per so se. So how much money before was going to cash assistance, we'll say? Three years ago was near a hundred thousand dollars was in that category, and last year it was seventy eight. And then we did a budget modification. This is before <coughs> I got there, and it was ninety three. We spent eighty seven thousand dollars last year on those kinds of payments in both counties. Okay. Yeah. So next year it's going to be forty three. Exactly. Okay. And we're we're on track. We're <coughs> in this year alone. We're about at midpoint here, and we've only spent twenty a little over twenty thousand dollars and people are happy they're not leaving you know and what they're gaining is far more than what they would have gained if you just keep paying their light bill and we still pay light bills you know but we just ask them to pay apart you know I tell them I'm not gonna pay late fees like if you know you're having a problem come in before it's late it's a conversation and it's a relationship building so for instance a client that walks in the door say or to walk into your door and you know, try to initiate some services. What's the process? You sit down, evaluate my situation, what's going on, decide what services I need. Is that correct? Yeah, well, you <coughs> see, the model now is that we don't decide what you need. We talk to you about what you think you need. But we have a waiting list in both counties. There's over 50 people on the waiting list at all times. So we just go right down the waiting list. But now we've created a criteria that Dion was talking about earlier where we look at and actually rate like from one to ten so if you have a car then your transportation is not a need and that's not just in our county that's across the nation is how they do it to look at how vulnerable you are in your housing situation in your child care situation in your education sometimes people just need a boost and then other people need to say okay I need one more class and I'll have my bachelor's degree <coughs> that kind of thing. so basically educating them on their situation is what pulls them out of this is that correct educating them and partnering with them because a lot of times sometimes people are successful and they don't want to leave you know I had a young lady in Rowan recently she was like I don't want to leave but she was over the income guidelines once you're over the income guidelines you're no longer eligible and how do you know what the income guidelines are it's do you have a way to 
to it's monitor a, it's that. It's the federal guidelines. Right. But, I mean, do you have a way to... Oh, we collect all their income information okay. at the, uh, the onset, and then every 90 days we collect it. Okay. And then do you also refer your clients to services at Department of Social Services yes. or the Health Alliance? Yes. Did I hear you say that the lady did not want to leave <coughs> Section 8 housing? No, she didn't want to leave our program after oh, she got oh, above okay. the guidelines because okay. the relationship she had with her family okay. development. I just, I and just she was afraid that she might not be able to do it on her own, but she's fine. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Anything else? But as I know this correctly, this is not money coming from Cabarrus County that we're approving. This is federal yeah. grants. Is being we are receiving their yeah. report. Right. Yeah. And acknowledging the receipt of the report. And I think um, because of the fact that we're on TV that we're also educating our citizens in Cabarrus County to find out what's going on. And um, I think that's always a, a good thing. The more we can learn and the more we can help to get a message out, the better off we are. So. And they can come to the office and fill out an application with mm -hmm. Dion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. The next item we have, Scott, you've been very patient. Um, Senior Centers Advisory Council, Active Living and Parks Administrative Staff uh, letter. And Mr. Scott's here. Welcome. Thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here tonight. And, um, I thought it might be interesting to you all in light of the problems that we have experienced or with the uh, recent merger in July 1 um, of the senior centers and the parks and DSS and making the human services uh, connection. And I thought maybe I would just bring you up to date about the um, last meeting that we had at the Senior Center, our advisory council. Um, and after we go through a series of reporting for various committees that we serve on, and um, Ted Drain, who chairs the Strategic uh, Planning Committee, after he finished his report, he noted that the um, assistance that the Senior Center has received recently by the active living and parks re employees at recent large events that we have promoted, that um, he just made mention of how wonderful they were and what a pleasure it was to have these young people helping the seniors accomplish what they needed to do in much less time and with much less effort. And this comment led to Ted's discussion about maybe, maybe it's time for us to revisit the idea of bringing the park's administrative staff into the senior center to occupy the vacant offices there. As he was talking, I noticed among our board members that various heads were nodding in affirmation. And so I thought, well, you know, this is a good thing. I'm, I'm delighted and happy to see the change of, of heart here. So I asked Ted if he would like to put in a motion the statements that he had just made about combining or about having the senior, the parts staff maybe come into our building. So he, um, he did make this motion and after um, when it was the time for discussion, Jean Chandler said, I want to say something. She said, I was opposed to the suggestion initially of having the parks join us in our building. But with time, she said, I've seen that these employees are such an asset to the senior center and the programs that we sponsor. 
So it shows that opinions have changed, and she said that she would certainly, could certainly support this move if we decided with our vote to recommend this to the county commissioners. So uh, many, some other folks also had comments about they were so excited and how happy, what a wonderful uh, past events had been with this extra help. So the vote was called for and it was a unanimous vote and I'm very happy to say that. So I as chairman would like to, um, was asked to write a letter to you and ask you or let this be a recommendation to you to make that this to vote for this to happen so i'm asking you tonight to please approve that the active living park staff relocate their offices to the concord senior center and i'll be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have does anybody have any questions Commissioner Meesmer, were you at the meeting? I was. You are the liaison. That's correct. And as I mentioned uh, at our previous commissioner meeting, I uh, give a report on uh, the meeting, not as detailed as Mrs. Honeycutt's here, but it went as followed. So she, uh, it's, um, it was a request, so that's why, I, that's why it's before us. I'll be happy to make a motion to suspend the rules and vote on and make a motion tonight to approve. Any other? Okay. Well, we have a motion. We have a second to suspend the rules. Um, is there any discussion on that particular motion to suspend the rules to take action on this tonight? All those in favor of suspending the rules signify by saying yes. Aye. Right. Yes. Right. Yes or aye. Those opposed? Okay. Um, does anybody want to make the I'd make a motion to uh, accept the request of the um, Cabarrus County Senior Citizens Senior Centers Advisory Council to include the Cabarrus County Active and Living Living in Parks into their building or into the building. I have a motion and I have a second. Is there any comments? Any additional comments? Okay. Um, all those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Well, there you go. Thank you very, very much. Well, we appreciate you coming tonight, and um, you it's nice for you to bring such good news. Thank you. So, and Ms. Strong is here, so she can, she can work on it. There you go. We'll leave that up to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, next, we have 4.6. Debbie Brannon is here and been very patient. ITS, IT, uh, pictometry, imagery, and services contract. Good evening. Tonight I'm bringing um, to you a contract for consideration for pictometry. Um, we've actually had this particular company fly um, two flights over the last four years and this contract is for flights for 2013, 15, and 16 to provide um, pictometry um, pictures and um, in for those of you, just as a reminder, that gives us a 3D view of the buildings. Um, it allows um, like the tax assessor to do um, accurate measurements on, on parcels without having to travel all over the county. Um, it's also used by planning and zoning, I think co code enforcement. It gives us an archive of pictures of the county over the years. And it's also used for public safety. This contract is for six years. Um, it's been reviewed by um, Mr. Cook, um, and there is a fiscal out clause if you decide not to continue at any time. Okay. Questions? I think with the county changing like it is, I'm, I'm glad there's the opportunity for three flyovers uh, to get it more as current as possible. I mean, you can do every year, but I think that's cost prohibitive, and I think this is a good opportunity to do it. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Now, this isn't just used by Cabarrus County. The municipalities use yes. this also? The um, contract also includes the ability for us to share that with the municipalities as well. 
when was the when was the last time this was done two years ago two years ago mm-hmm. so 2011 okay had a little change in the last two years <coughs> I believe uh, the tax department's going to find a few changes <laughs> okay. any other questions come on spring and leaves right there you go <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you know about when the flyover would be in 2013? It will be sometime late this month or early February. So before the leaves get out. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. That is Having a family contract. member that does a lot of GPSing, I am very much aware of uh, when there are leaves and you can GPS or you cannot GPS, so what you can actually get done in the wintertime. So. Um, okay. If there's no other questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next, we have Kelly Sifford for the next four items. And we're going to start off with um, HCCBG Committee Rules of Operation and Lead Entity Designation. Yes, Welcome. ma'am. Thank you. Um, outside of the planning office, I do serve on the HCCBG Committee, which is the Home Care Community Block uh, Grant Committee. And uh, Kathy Maurer is here as well. She serves on the committee. Um, we have gone through some changes with the restructuring that did happen um, with aging and uh, as part of that um, you know the uh, cog was uh, appointed the interim uh, lead agency and as part of that they made some suggestions to our committee about um, improvements that we could make based on what was going on in other agencies uh, and other committees throughout the region and so we looked at those and we agreed that yes we could probably make some improvements in, in it we didn't have any rules of operation um, in how we were handling it so um, before you have we have a set of rules for operating that we um, pulled from other agencies and kind of compiled what we thought were appropriate for us um, as part of that um, we have a, a list of designated agencies in the um, rules of operation that we would like for uh, those to be perpetual members of this committee and then there are some other uh, people or types of people set out in that in there that we would like to be the other members the reason being for the selection of those agencies um, being perpetual members is because they uh, are funded through this program and um, we have uh, kind of the consumer side of it and then the, the funding side of it the people who have to carry out the the providers who, who do this um, so we tried to um, balance the committee so that we would have both on there so that um, we could represent the providers and what we have to do according to the grants and then the consumers can tell us what they need and how they need it um, and the final thing is um, that we as a group decided that the human services department should be the lead entity moving forward so that is our uh, set of recommendations and we would like all of that to take effect uh, July 1st um, that will give us time to complete some training with uh, human services so that they will be in a good place to start on July 1st and it also coincides with our contracts ending with COG so that we can move forward cleanly are there questions any questions Kathy you need to add anything <laughs> hey my question would be uh, we've already talked about ways that our citizens can serve so for the composition of the committee it says seven at-large Cabarrus County citizens mm -hmm. um, do you have people already serving there are some serving that will be there mm -hmm. or do you have vacancies there will be vacancies and we will be starting to recruit um, there, uh, there are some people serving, but we need, we do need to boost that up. Um, we have had some kind of lagging attendance, so we're working on that, um, and we should be able to resolve that and hopefully have some of those before you uh, for July for about by July first, so that they can be approved and get on the committee. I think right now the, there's at least three or four that are that are clients, and that was one of the questions I asked: is was it going to be difficult to get up to the level of seven? And they didn't think that the clients did not think it would be that difficult and then the question became well if, if it's not going to be that difficult are they going to be able to make each one of the meetings and there's four meetings a year so it shouldn't be that that was the next thing so that was discussed and they didn't think that would be a problem yes and part of our problem was that we were not meeting regularly that's one thing that we have changed um, we were pretty much meeting um, around budget time so usually one to two meetings a year um, we think that the quarterly method will work a little better um, 
you know, when you do something once a year, it's kind of hard to get to it. So um, meeting quarterly, we can keep everybody up to date a little better on um, activities and um, education process, which is one of the things that they really want to work on moving forward is getting getting the word out there a little better. And um, having these rules of operation, we felt like would be a little more transparent for the public about how we were operating because we are making recommendations to you about funding. That's what I was going to ask. If you could elaborate, what what does the committee do? And you're making recommendations on funding for what type I of services? Absolutely, should have said that in the first place. <laughs> you're correct. The um, home commu care community block grant. Um, we receive funds um, through the state. Uh, they are federal dollars. Um, the state adds some to it. Um, what we do with that? Um, there are several funding. I can't remember off the top of my head how many we have, but uh, they do things like in-home care, um, consumer-directed care, the housing and home improvement program, uh, the transportation program, the medical transportation that we provide. Um, they fund all of those type of programs. And there's, I should have brought the funding list with me, but what we do each year is we sit down and we look at waiting lists. Who has a waiting list? How long is their waiting list? What are the needs? How does that work? Mills on Wheels is also funded through this program. So um, each year we, discuss funding levels and, and, and make those recommendations to you on what we think those where the, we think those funds should go and when if occasionally we'll have a little extra money trickle in um, when everything's said and done and they kind of get everything out there and uh, so we try to kind of determine what's the best use of those funds depending on how much we get um, you know sometimes we may get less than ten thousand dollars and you know that buys a lot of meals on wheels um, so, you know, we kind of sit down as a group and say, okay, how can we best use this? How can we get the biggest bang for what's left over here and, and make those recommendations then to you as well? Who, who, who are the recipients of the funds and the services? The recipients of the funds, um, I don't think, well, the consumer directed care may have a little bit of cash payout to the client um, in the form of, I think that you can buy like products that keep you in the home so maybe if they need a microwave to heat their meals or something like that you could do that but it, most of it is in the form of um, like in my case the housing and home improvement program we build wheel wheelchair ramps and do grab bars and things like that to keep the client in the home longer and keep them safe so that they don't fall um, the in-home care they get some assistance in the home um, that keeps them from getting institutionalized um, you know those type of services that are um, we buy for them that keep them in the home which is cheaper on you in the long run if we keep them from getting institutionalized and most people are happier in their home so we that's what our goal is to keep them in their home as long as possible and all of these funds are for people 60 and over and that is the long-term goal of all of this is to keep people in their homes as long as possible okay, so so again uh, 60 and over so these are senior citizens um, that we're enabling or, or Yes. Helping and to um, continue to stay in their home and to continue to be able to um, take care of themselves. Correct. And those funds are directed through planning, um, human services, transportation, uh, parks, and active living. So all those departments have taken some of those functions and, and, and support that through that. So with the, the um, at-large members or those senior citizens that we would be looking for? Correct. To serve on there? Okay. We like to have consumers. <laughs> So, okay, so by consumers, senior citizens for this committee, yes. okay. And um, so somewhere, if we could, maybe May before, if you have openings, mm -hmm. if you could let us know, especially because the way I read this, who represent various geographic areas of the county, if you know that there's a certain area of the county, then maybe in our May meeting, mm -hmm. um, we can mention again about your board if there's any vacancies and that we're looking for someone in a certain part of the county and then maybe um, by this being on channel 22 that gets the word out and it might find somebody that's you know watching that and that might be kind of interested and that that'll get you you know some time for June to <coughs> make contacts and mm -hmm. and see if if you can't fill all those vacancies I should be able to get it to you before that we're meeting again on the 14th whenever it month, works for you so I don't want to rush you but whenever it works for you I think that would be good it's, we'll um, get we'll try to get a location on exactly because we, we did talk like, about um, at the last meeting we talked about the youth council and you know mm -hmm. where you have vacancies so mm -hmm. anyway we can get the word out on on um, opportunities to um, to help out in the community I think it's a good thing and Commissioner White you're our liaison to this particular group I will not make a comment on your age. I will let that one go. But I'm glad that you are. <laughs> I'm
I'm glad. I don't think you qualify, but I'm glad that you are um, our liaison there. I qualify. What now? <laughs> I don't think you're old enough to qualify. <laughs> <laughs> I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. So, um, thank you very much on that Thanks. one. Thanks. The next item that we have uh, is text amendments. The next three items are different text amendments. So, if you want to just do those one, two, three, we can go there. <laughs> and we have Susie Morris coming. Yeah, Susie actually wrote that. these. Um, so I'll let her take over and talk about it. Um, the first amendment is a, a one in a series of three. This is an amendment to chapter one. This is part of the overall review that we have been working through with our zoning ordinance. There were some ch changes that needed to be made in chapter one. The text amendment committee, the planning and zoning commission, as well as legal counsel have all reviewed these changes and we are ready to move forward with them. Um, if you had a chance to look at the text, the red text is the text to be changed and then anything that is in strike through text, that will be deleted. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have and the Planning and Zoning Commission did vote unanimously on this in December uh, to move it forward to you all for final consideration. Any questions on 4.8? Okay, we will, okay. That's okay. We will have a public hearing at our regular meeting, and so you do have a couple weeks to make sure that you get through all of it, and in the event you have any additional questions, of course, we can handle those that night, too. Uh, do you want to explain 4.9, please? Um, the second amendment is an amendment to remove Chapter 4, Section 17, which is the Adequate Public Facilities Standards Ordinance from the Subdivision Ordinance. Um, as you all know, we were not successful in our request for the Supreme Court to rehear our case. Um, so that, that entire section needs to be removed from the ordinance. Um, and it is the subdivision ordinance. So we need to deal with the subdivision ordinance as well as the zoning ordinance. Um, and it was added at the end of the chapter. So um, it will just be removed and it really doesn't impact the rest of the ordinance. Okay. Any questions at this time? 4.10. The last amendment is to completely remove Chapter 15 from the zoning ordinance. This is the ordinance that sets the part of the zoning ordinance that sets up the adequate public facilities ordinance as well as how calculations are performed. So this would be completely removing Section 15. Um, and again, because it's completely removing this section from the ordinance, um, we won't need to uh, renumber or go back and make any additional changes to Chapter 15 it will just completely be removed from the ordinance any question on this one okay we will call for public hearings for all three of those um, at our regular meeting that's correct and I'm sure that we'll have some discussion <laughs> or comments maybe in that that'll be a public hearing we may have some comments in okay commissioners uh, next we have the approval of the regular meeting agenda if you will look at the paperwork that you have and or um, page 223 on your iPads. If you'll notice, uh, <coughs> we will need to delete number eight. Number five? Number five and number eight from the consent agenda. So six will become five, seven will become six, nine will become seven fairly or, uh, obvious and then of course the new new um, the new business items will be the public hearings and um, the text amendments Are there any any um, questions comments about the agenda as you have before you with those two changes um, note that uh, to make reference to number one uh, under the consent agenda I'm not asking to pull it off we just make a note for the public to understand that there's going to be road construction going on. It, it gives the, the public the idea that, or let them know where it's going to be and, and it, we can reference them. Uh, not that we have to take it off and have a full blown presentation, but at least it'll allow the public to see that there are roads in Cabarrus County that are getting improved. We can do that. Any other comments? If not, at this time, I would accept a motion that we approve the agenda for the regular meeting uh, with the uh, two deletions. So moved. Have a motion. We have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Hey, we do have a need for a closed session tonight, um, and we would like to invite in uh, Mr. Cox and Mr. McDaniels to our uh, meeting. So at this time, I would like to I would accept a motion to go to the closed session. So moved. As authorized by North Carolina General Statute 143-318-11A4 and to consult with our county attorney. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. We are now in closed session. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight and staying in here for the long haul.